And welcome once again to EW10's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author, Stephen F. Auth. The book, Pilgrimage to the Museum, Man's Search for God Through Art and Time, published by Sophia Institute Press, available through our EW10 Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com for all things Catholic. Great to see you again, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Doug. We got to talk about your last book a, a couple of years ago at, at one of the uh, Napa events. Uh, we, are, we are out there... Uh, you know, evangelizing the streets of New York. Is it is it safe to do that anymore? We're we're been out there. We we were out there for Holy Week. Um, I actually got more post confession hugs right. than I've ever gotten, if you can believe it. We were we were at the cathedral this this Friday night, actually, last Friday yeah. night. Great. So let's talk about this book that was put together between yourself, your wife, and Father Sean Aaron. Uh, pilgrimage to the museum. Now, why is it a pilgrimage? Why isn't it just a tour of a museum? It's uh, a pilgrimage is meant to be a, a kind of spiritual journey, and and we try to approach the art as a spiritual journey through time, and it's a struggle at times, and there's peaks and valleys like any spiritual journey, and that's how it is with the art too. But when you approach the art through the eyes of faith, mm -hmm. it it comes alive in a way that it that is meant to come alive in in my mind. We um, you know really believe that. God is beauty, and uh, and artists have this ability to describe beauty. In some ways, I think are searching for His image right. in their own souls through their art. Now, one of the paintings uh, that kind of kicked this thing off for you was the Toilet of Bathsheba. Now, obviously, Bathsheba, there's a connection with with David, with the Old Testament. What is it about this particular painting that really brought everything together for you? It, it might have been the time and place, Doug. I, I, you know, surely earlier it had a deeper conversion experience mm -hmm. as on any kind of spiritual journey we're all on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had training in, in art history, so I'm used to a kind of classical description of a painting like that, Rembrandt's Oriental Period, et cetera. And I was with a docent from the Met, mm -hmm. and everything that she was saying was absolutely correct. And on the other hand, was completely missing mm -hmm. the real point, the underlying mystery of the thing. Right. And the more I, I meditated on the painting, the more I saw that this wasn't really Rembrandt's image of Bathsheba at all. It was actually his image of Bathsheba in David's mind, mm -hmm. as he took what Father Sean likes to tell me is the dangerous second look. You know, the right, first look's right, not right. your fault, the second look is. Right. So I, I'm actually looking here at David playing with the image of Bathsheba in his mind, right. and really at the slippery slope of sin that's going to ensue. Well, you say that, that yeah. you think that maybe that's the title of the painting really should be, right? Yeah, yeah, the slippery slope of sin. And uh, you know, once we, I came back from that painting and saying, you know, maybe we need to be thinking about this very differently, mm -hmm. and approach the art at a deeper level, and that kind of opened the floodgates. Right. As we took, we, we decided to take the one presumption that God has put the timeless into our hearts, to quote from Ecclesiastes, and even when we don't know it, He's mm -hmm. put it there. Let's search, let's go and search for that. Right. And when you go back 5,000 years to ancient Egypt, you can work your way all the way up through the moderns with that presumption, and see the art at a much deeper level. And it be. <clears throat> At that point, Doug, what was a tour of the museum that my wife and I would give on Friday nights became a pilgrimage, a right. spiritual journey. Right. Well, you say we looked at paintings we used to think were unimportant or by lesser artists, and now they suddenly seem pivotal to the narrative. An intellectual dam had broken, the pieces came together. And you talk about the fact that there's great museums, but you happen to be a New Yorker, so it was the Met. Uh, and you talk about the idea that the Met is really just incidental. We're not looking for one particular collection of art. We're looking for God. That's why we won't be looking only at paintings and sculptures. We'll be looking at our own souls. Is that what people are looking for in paintings or should be looking for? I think they are looking for it even when they don't realize it. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people, don't they go to a museum mm -hmm. seeking something? And they often come away after the first 45 minutes of fairly banal descriptions, somewhat, frankly, disenchanted. But they don't want to leave that quickly. It would seem boorish. They last another 45, and then they leave. But they come away kind of missing something. I think people are coming away looking for something eternal 
in art, something transcendental. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned Egypt right at the beginning, and, and, and in the beginning, you start off with men as gods in ancient Eve and Egypt, and you talk about, I guess, the tomb of Perneb, and uh, you talk about the images and where, where the where he's placed in relation to himself and, and looking at his tomb. You seem that you got a lot of insight from this, I have to admit, greater insight than I have. Could I, you explain? I like to tell people this is, uh, you know, Catholic priests always tell you you've never seen a, a, uh, a U-Haul following a hearse. I said, well, let me show you one. Mm -hmm. So in ancient Egypt, oh, in the funerary practices, the idea was you could bring it with you. And, of course, they bury everything with them if you're wealthy enough. But everybody knew that, so within 50 years or so, the tombs would be sacked. And, and so they had a plan B, which was the paintings on the wall. And in the tomb of Pernab, you see this U-Haul following the hearse of all his little servants bringing him all his favorite things for the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And Pernab has painted himself bigger than life, seated, which in an Egyptian context is seated as a god. I see. So it's, you know, the inverse of you are God, I am not. I am God, you are not. The Egyptians are seeking the eternal, but they thought if they were wealthy enough, they could make themselves into gods. At that point, everyone on the pilgrimage usually chuckles at the foibles of the Egyptians till I ask them the next question, which is, when have you made yourself a god? Right. And you say here, maybe there's a little of Perneb in all of us. Maybe that's what original sin is. Yeah. Pride? Pride. And it comes up again and again. You know, there's all these motifs and themes that recur through the pilgrimage. But you see men struggling with this pride thing mm -hmm. all the way through it. And sometimes they conquer it and find the way to God through humility. And then sometimes it comes right back again and they lose God. These are the peaks and valleys of the spiritual life that you experience on that a pilgrimage. All of us go through. That all of us go through. Right. And that's why you say, don't feel too bad about poor Perneb. We'll be running into him again and again and again. Yeah. We look in the mirror. Right, absolutely. You also talk about, I was going to ask you, so did cancel culture really start in ancient Egypt? Yeah, in some ways it does, <laughs> right? You're referring to the tomb of Hatshepsut. And now we're in the New Kingdom period around the time of actually the Israeli, uh, the Hebrew exile in Egypt. But uh, yeah, poor Hatshepsut, she was one of the greatest pharaohs uh, of her day. She tried to make herself into a god, as they usually do. Um, but when her, she was the regent to her nephew, and, and she kind of took over, became the pharaoh. But when she died, he finally assumed power, Thumatos III. And the first thing he did was he cleared out all the images, there were like 50 of them, right. in this temple, <laughs> right. chopped them all up into bits, and buried her in a 50-foot pit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of getting into heaven, she sort of ended up in a 50-foot pit, unfortunately. Absolutely. You also talk about the rise of the Greeks, God as men. And one of the things I thought was interesting that uh, you mentioned the fact that the Greeks invented money, have money will travel. Coinage gave the Greeks a distinct advantage in trade. That's an interesting point. You, if you're a person who's dealt with money your whole life, right? Yeah, so these kind of little tidbits in history, are, you know, my little putting pieces together. But I do think that the, the one thing that explains the rise of the Greeks mm -hmm. was that as the mercantile system of the Mediterranean grew, the guys who control the sea ended up, and of course the Greeks are in the heart of the sea, and that's where art goes, and you have that great flowering of art in ancient, uh, you know, uh, Athens. Why does it seem like with some, sometimes, at least in some of the sculptures and things like that, we look back, and I'm kind of jumping ahead in history, and we say, it, it seems like these people had greater talent or greater skills than even the people do today. Yeah, I, I think you always got to look at it in the context of the spirituality of the time. A lot of times that drives um, what you see in the painting or in the sculpture that you think is a, a difference in skill, but might be a difference in attitude. So you see that in the Middle Ages, where a lot of the images are kind of two-dimensional and abstract. It's not because they were unskilled. Mm -hmm. It's because they were trying to describe people, saints, that are up in heaven, not here on earth. And there's this wonderful image in the pilgrimage of Lorenzo Monaco's painting of Christ and the Virgin interceding for the sinners. Right. And one of the things yeah, I that, that I... Yeah, I love that picture. Yeah. And that's a great description you give of that. Yeah, and, and it's... It, one of the things that's amazing about it 
is he uses two forms of painting. He uses this abstract international Gothic style to describe Christ and the Virgin and God who are up in heaven. But then down below are the sinners. Right. And there he uses the new Renaissance style of three-dimensional painting, shaded figures, and actual portraits. These are real people. Mm -hmm. They're Pernip. They're the patrons of this magnificently expensive work. It's done in blue azure paint, which was extreme. It was a precious stone. So here, in the Middle Ages, or this is around the turn of the Renaissance, it's uh, 1400, you see the patrons of the painting painting themselves as the little people kneeling before God, asking forgiveness for their sins, right. and Mary pushing them forward. Yes, and that's Lawrence the Monk, is that who we're talking Lawrence about? Lawrence the Monk. Lorenzo right. Monaco was the painter. Right. Yeah. Right. You talk about the kind of the transitioning from Gothic into a kind of a new kind of realism, right? Yeah. Uh, that's a beautiful page. It's actually on page 69 in the book, but if we jump back to page 63 as well, uh, there's another image of the Madonna and child as well, which you have a really interesting discussion about even how th you think the bottom of the frame is is the bottom of the frame, but it's really part of the painting, the idea of Our Lady looking out the window. Why, why did you think that was important? So this is like, this painting stunned New York. The director of the museum at the time spent 45 million on it, made a preemptive bid before the Louvre could get their hands on it. The only Duccio in private hands left. Mm -hmm. Most of his paintings were on the walls in Siena and the cathedrals. Mm -hmm. So here you have the beginning of modern art in some ways, because mm -hmm. instead of a traditional Madonna and child, um, you have a Madonna child now on earth. Mm -hmm. That's the balustrade. So now right. you're looking in through the window. And what's really beautiful about it, in my mind, is that he starts to paint the inner workings of the mind. I, I call it the beginning to try to paint the soul. You see... The inner thoughts. The inner say, thoughts. Yeah, you right. see Mary looking down um, with some trepidation mm -hmm. and concern at Jesus. And then the little baby Jesus reaching up and consoling his mother. It's a beautiful, beautiful image that really begins art on a new quest uh, to paint the soul of men here on Earth. Right, and, and that whole idea of that, that interplay, as you say, and that contemplation and the relationship, getting inside the relationship between yeah. the Blessed Mother and, and her child. You talk about also the, the, the Mother of God as you as c continues on that image with the penitence, et cetera, but that establishment of Our Lady, but that the idea that she was human being at the same time. Yeah, she's both mother and saint right. you know, in heaven. You also talk about in this single uh, composition, this goes back to the one you were talking about with, uh, with Monaco, the monk, Lorenzo has painted lasting image of Christian theology with God by the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So he's got the Trinity in there, right? Yeah. United by love for each other and for us. Mary is with us, with them in heaven, yet apart from the Trinity. I thought that was a really good point. Yeah, it's uh, one my, my wife likes to point out is that if you look at the halos very carefully, the halos of the Trinity have a cross in them. Mm -hmm. Mary's halo does not. So we, we pray to Mary to intercede for us. We pray to God as God. It's a difference, right? And Monica is very much onto that kind of theological distinction that is completely missed by most people that, you know, wander past it in the Met today. But it's also uh, representative of actual Catholic thought in, in it's the sense totally of Catholic. to make sure that Our Lady isn't part of the exactly the, the Trinity. Yeah. And another image, and this I, I, my my take is since for you to call it the Catholic Mona Lisa, I'm assuming. This must be one of your favorite paintings. Like it is Virgin, one of my favorite. Virgin it was painted almost the same year as uh, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's down in a little museum in Palermo. It's only been out of Palermo twice in 500 years. It came to the Met for a few weeks. Uh, and it, what's amazing to me about the painting, it's a painting of the Annunciation without the angel in it. Mm -hmm. And so he captures, in some ways, the ambiguity of the situation. I mean, the act of faith that it took for Mary to take on this assignment. And she's, you know the angel's there, you see the pages yeah, fluttering, it's interesting how you make that point. fluttering right, in the wind. Right, right. And her first reaction is to, you know, close her blouse, and then she kind of holds her hand out, saying like, hold on a minute here. Mm -hmm. And then you see her hand curling, which most of us don't do in prayer, actually listening. Mm -hmm. So she's listening to the word of God. 
and you can see her eyes intent on the angel, trying to understand this message, which, by the way, is basically mission impossible. I mean, this is a 16-year-old girl being asked. Uh, the odds are Joseph's going to probably, in her mind, she's thinking, what if he disowns me? I'll be stoned the next morning in the village. Right. If I get away from them, the herd will be after them, the Romans, and then the escape hatch is a 500-mile trek across a desert. And Mary somehow takes it on. And what I love are the lips, because don't most of us, if we get this far in prayer mm -hmm. and give our assent, how often do I forget to follow through, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and you're looking at those lips and you say, you know, I'm putting my money on the girl. Right. You say, concerned yet determined. Mary has been asked to take on a spiritual job that at best seems well above her pay grade. Yeah. And then you say to talk about the eyes. They're not the far off eyes of a youth who's heading out to live her dream or to do her thing. There's focus, determination, love, obedience, perseverance, which is what obviously what Our Lady was going to need. Yeah. To be able to do For what she was called assignment. to do. Now you've got, uh, you know, Rembrandt is in here, uh, obviously without him, and you pick this one, uh, Aristotle with the bust of Homer. And you say it's the most compelling description I found by which most people today refer to it is a sterile, is Aristotle with the bust by Homer. And you refer to it, though, as Rembrandt, a soul in struggle. Yeah. I tell people it's his favorite, is, is my favorite self portrait by Rembrandt. And mm -hmm. if a docent's walking by, they'll smirk because I go, like, I doesn't even know that that's not a self portrait. Mm -hmm. It's not a visage of, of Rembrandt at all. But it's his soul and struggle. This time, Rembrandt is, is in a deep moral struggle, which we get into a little bit in the mm -hmm. book. And in this image, he's been asked to paint a Greek philosopher, so he chooses Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And if you see him in that image, he's got his right hand on virtue, which is the bust of Homer, mm -hmm. and his left hand on the gold chain, which he's been given by, Arist by uh, Alexander the Great, the mm -hmm. ill-gotten wealth of the world that Jesus likes to talk about. Right. And what I love about the painting is it's not clear what Aristotle, or let's say Rembrandt, is going to do. He's kind of padding right. virtue. He's fingering the gold chain. And in the image of his face, it's a window into his own soul right. struggling. And I think for all of us, isn't it that like faith is a lifelong commitment right. and it's a daily struggle? And that image for me is the daily struggle of the path of virtue. Right. Right. You talk about how Aristotle's not actually grasping the chain, he's fingering it. Yeah. He's considering it. Like you said, he's, he's debating where am I to go? And, and this was an insight that I think you mentioned, uh, if I read it right, that your, that your wife Evelyn kind of focused in on, right? Yeah, she focuses in on the, uh, the left hand. Some people have complained that the left hand is larger than the right hand. You know, Rembrandt screwed up the, the hands, but of course it's Rembrandt. Let's assume he did it on purpose. So Evelyn would say, well, it's the lure of the gold mm -hmm. is stronger. Maybe. That's what he's saying. Later on, and, and it wasn't one we particularly picked out, but I had to, on page 142, is The Return of the Prodigal Son by Rembrandt. And of course, for EWTN viewers, they, they've seen that on the set yeah. of The Journey Home for the last 25 years. Yeah. It's, it's such a great... Well, image. I had to include that, even though that's from the Hermitage. But, yeah. um, you know, there's a subtext of, of Rembrandt's own story. This is Rembrandt's last painting painted with no commission. Mm -hmm. He's the prodigal son. I see. Okay. So there's a reflection in, in, in the book about that and about how all of us are in some ways the prodigal son. Right, exactly. Or sometimes we're the older son. Right. Which yeah. is almost Depending on the worse. situation, right? Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. Now you got young man in the costume. Uh, and uh, at the Mejo, how is it pronounced? Costume of a Mojo. Mojo. So there, that's somebody involved with a bullfight. Is that what? I yeah, mean? I call that the. Well, that's actually not. Okay. It's a boy in the cost. That's the whole point. I call it the anti duccio moment in art arriving. So God is now dead, right? It's the enlightenment. Okay. And now we're, you know, we're moving on beyond God, and the artist starts to make himself God, and he says, "This is not a Mojo." Mm -hmm. This is someone in my studio modeling as a mojo so I can paint his uniform. 
and he has this blank look on his face. Right, you make the point how blank the whole thing is. Right. right, there's no attempt to paint a soul here because there is no soul once you get rid of God. And that's, uh, art enters, to me, a very dark, dark time from there on in. And that's why you make it as an anti Ducho moment? Right, because I refer back to the Ducho we talked yeah. about yeah. as the moment where artists begin this quest to paint the soul. And Manet ends that quest. It says, artists, like all of us, reflect the culture and understanding of the time. They were not alone in slipping toward atheism, toward a belief that we are on our own and need henceforth to make our own decisions using our own moral compass. We are all guilty as charged. You think that, that we're dealing with that to a great degree today as well? As well? It pervades the society. Right. And that was what, Manet? That was Manet, Manet 1864. Right. Then there's also Monet and the, and the dealing with Impressionism and the, and the Cathedral of Rouen. Uh, it's an interesting take, the idea of kind of you see the image, but it's, it's not, it's just the outside. Yeah, it's the outside of the church. And earlier in the, in the pilgrimage, we're on the inside of a church. Mm -hmm. And of course, the inside, the beautiful stained glass windows, the mystery of the Eucharist, heaven on earth. But from the outside where Monet paints it, it's just a surface of stone that he can play with for colors of light. Mm -hmm. He's closed the doors. The stained glass windows are grayed out. Mm -hmm. He's removed from the image, the 36 images of saints on the surface of the cathedral. There's no one moving in and out. I refer to it as God's tomb. Right, right. Yeah, nothing, nothing is happening at all. And then you, you kind of connect it at the time to, uh, it's pretty well accepted in history that circles then. When I had shifted early in his life from being a Catholic to convicted atheism, you said Nietzsche not only had declared God dead, by the way, he even told us that God had died, that we had killed him. And you say Monet was just the messenger who did so. Yeah. Now we also, it goes from there, and now, and now we're moving down even to, we've got George Seurat, uh, who many people know from Sunday in the Park with George, uh, right. the show, yeah. and, and the famous painting on the island of La Grande Jatte. Uh, but this is something else that's even starker. How? Yeah, it's, isn't it interesting? I mean, the circus sideshow, so this should be a, a group of musicians that are happy and having a good time, and they're all alone through the haze. They're not interacting with the audience. The audience seems to be ignoring them. I don't think anyone in there is having a good time. Mm -hmm. And there's a loneliness. I mean, once you've killed off God, then we're no longer brothers and sisters in him. And we, we're all alone. Right. And you've right? got that connection with the science and pointillism as well, right? Dealing right. just with color for the, the sake of color. Exactly. That was more interesting to him. Right. But what was left was a deep sense of loneliness, I think, in the painting. Right. Yeah. It, 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 it has a very flat affect, obviously. So at the very end of the book, you've got uh, everything back where it belongs. And you say, Dolly is customarily the last painting on our tour. Its image of pure love, the love of the cross, seems a perfect antidote to the dark themes of the 1800s and the 1900s. Well, what about the, the century we're in now? Love is, love conquers all. I, I'm convinced from my work as a missionary in New York from this pilgrimage, and in the end of the day, the love of Christ is the light in the world. It mm -hmm. still is, as much as the culture t tries to push it down and push it into the darkness. So we end the pilgrimage in that very uplifting way um, where I think Dolly gets it right. right. So in this pilgrimage that you do at, at the museum, how long does it take you to actually go through a particular it, day of doing it? It takes three and a half hours at high speeds. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to wear sneakers. Okay. And we're up and down a lot of back staircases and alleys. And even so, we would only typically on any given night hit a cross-section of the paintings in the pilgrimage. So the pilgrimage was an attempt mm -hmm. to give the experience of this live tour at the Met to a much broader group of people. So we, we right. wrote it kind of like as a pilgrimage. You feel like you're there, I think. That was right. sort of what we're trying to accomplish. Well, you certainly feel like you're on a journey because yeah. it, it does take you through, in a sense, the pre-Christian period into the Christian period into what amounts to a post-Christian period, yeah. right, in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah, you see the beginning, the middle, and the end, and maybe a new beginning. Right. Okay, very good. 
So how long did it take you to write the book? Well, in some ways it took me 10 years, Doug, because we've been working on this for a long time, but the actual writing comes easier to me once it's all in my head, so four or five months maybe. Okay, yeah. we'll put it together. Okay, yeah. the book, Pilgrimage to the Museum, Man's Search for God Through Art and Time. Thank you so much, Thank Steve. Thank you, Doug. Great to be with you. Stephen Auth is the author, along with his wife and also Father Sean Aaron, L.C. This book is available through our E.W. General Religious Catalog. Check it out, ewgenrc.com, all things Catholic. I'm Doug Keck. Thank you for joining us here on This Bookmark.